Um, excellent. So up next, we have got Alex Wade from Wade Environmentals. Just ask Alex to pop up. Good morning, Alex. Good morning, John. How are you doing today? Very good. Yourself? Doing very well. There we go. Sat on my field. It's it's <laughs> uh, all an illusion, guys. I'm not really in a field. But there we go. I will leave you to Alex. <laughs> Perfect stuff. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Alex Wade. For those who know me, I am the director of Wade Environmental. And today I'm going to be talking to you about the wonderful world of rodents. So first things first, let's do a couple of introductions. Number one. Who am I? Well, I'm Alex Wade, as I said before, Director of Wade Environmental. Um, we are a specialist consultancy. And what we do basically is, is three things. We do um, professional development, which is where we can help your companies. We do personal development, which is where we help you learn. And we do product development, which is actually very interesting, just following on from Ryan's talk there. Because in a previous life, I used to be Mr. Ronsil for the company I used to work for previously, one of the UK's largest manufacturers and developers of rodenticides and insecticides. And yes, it was it was a wonderful trip down memory, memory lane that uh, what I used to have to do was exactly as Ryan was saying, I'd have to take those products and either take them into the lab. And if it said cut, killed 100 percent of flies in five minutes, then I had to breed the flies. Then I had to introduce them to insecticides and prove exactly what we wanted to say it did on the label. Uh, if it said killed brown rats and house mice. Muggins here had to go out and find the worst possible case scenarios of brown rats and house mice out in the fields, take those products to them and use them under the strictest conditions to prove that they would work um, under all situations. So that was super interesting listening to Ryan speak there. But what I'm going to be talking about today is I'm going to be talking about rats and mice and what makes them so uh, wonderfully adaptable, what makes a rat and a mouse um, tick just the way it does. And with that old adage, know your foe, more we get to know about them, the better we can try and control them by just knowing a little bit about how they work and what makes them tick. So I'm going to start off with, with that age old famous quote from Darwin himself, which says in the struggle for survival, the fittest will win out at the expense of their rivals because they succeed in adapting themselves best to their environment. And I would argue personally, and I'm sure there are others there that would agree and some who may disagree, but I would say that rats and mice are probably the most adaptable animals on the planet, um, even more so than human beings, because they have conquered territories as far as wide as far as we have if not further um but with that where we move from place to place we adapt the environment to suit ourselves when rodents move from place to place they have to adapt themselves to the environment they don't have the luxury of being able to um build aircon they have to be able to adapt to that environment and it used to be said that rats and mice had colonized every continent on earth except antarctica and now, thanks to the Scott Antarctic Ice Station and day trips and tourism, uh, we can't say that anymore. They're even there as well. So there we go. So let's see some of the things that make these guys just so adaptable. So first thing, what we're going to do today is we're going to try and build a rodent in five simple steps, if I have the time. And I'm sure I'm sure I can try and squeeze it all in there. But number one, I'd like you to think first off about these senses, just in very broad terms. So they have a tremendously acute sense of smell. Uh, and there's a huge amount of chemical communication goes on between that smell. It's not just a case of that smells like grain, that smells like vanilla. Now, actually, they can use this uh, sense of smell or one of their senses of smell, should I say, to actually communicate to each other. Conversely, they have terrible eyesight and we'll go on to that in just a little bit. Um, but where we think our eyesight's good, it's actually not that good. Their eyesight, which we think is bad, is absolutely awful. But they have these enhanced senses of smell and touch. And so they have this very, very um, advanced sense of touch as well, which was what makes them run alongside walls, what makes them huddle all together. They have a unique set of teeth and this digestion, which is what makes them commensal rodents. And they actually speak to each other in a very wide range of frequencies. So the young will communicate an ultrasound in order to try and get to contact with mum without letting everyone else in the area know they're there. But amazingly enough, and should I say, um, it's sweet even if you can say, rats and mice will communicate to each other using ultrasound when they go through courtship behaviors. So male mice will actually sing uh, a serenade the female mice in ultrasound in order to try and get a little bit of nookie. So, so there we go. But if there is one take home from today, 
and I hope there is more than one, but if there's one take home from today, I would like to say that when we say think like a rat, think like a mouse, we need to actually start to think about these senses and the order of importance to us and to them. Because to us, I would say, we are highly visual animals. We use our eyes to navigate the world. We use them when we drive, I hope. Uh, we use them to watch this presentation. And then we're using our ears to communicate. We're making these funny whooping and clicking and hissing noises that passes for communication. And we pick these up with our ears. It's basically Wi-Fi for human beings. The next three, I would argue, are a little bit more muddy. But my rationale between the next three is if you found a miscellaneous uh, stain on your sleeve, you would smell it before you touched it, definitely before you tasted it. And if you've got those in another order, I don't want you making my coffee. But at the same time, what is it do you think that is important to a rodent within that? Well, I would argue from the data we have to us, it is probably along these lines. They're by far and away the most important sense to them is their sense of smell, closely followed by this sense of touch, hearing, taste, and then eyesight is all the way at the end. So you suddenly see what's so important to us is definitely not important to them. And what we consider, you know, to be one of the miscellaneous three at the end is what is driving most of their behavior. So with that you know i want you to think about what it is you do as a pest management operator what you do when you are looking around site i mean e even the terminology was used we're using our eyes to survey the site um and i'm sure you have all seen it driving down the motorway stopping at a service station somewhere and you have found that rat box um tied to a lamppost in the middle of the car park uh, and i I'm sure you've all seen it and a couple of you may have even done it, but you know for a fact that that box is not there for rodents, that box is there for human beings. So what I want you to do when I say know your foe or think like a rat is to try and think what it is that is driving these animals and then try and put yourself in their position. And it's, it can be a lot harder than we actually, you know, it's a lot easier to say than it is to do. So let's have a look through some of these and let's have a look at what it is that makes these senses so radically different to ours and so wonderful to rodents. But first things first, I found this really fascinating um, bit of research where they took Daily, uh, they took mice in a lab, and any of you who remember Church Farm, we actually replicated this to a minor extent to try and figure out what mice and rats were doing. But this study basically said that they took mice in a lab and they viewed them over a 24 hour period and they broke down what it was that they were doing over that 24 hour period. Uh, and 26% of that time, they were locomoting about, they were walking about, they were finding, they were using those um, trusted runs, they were walking around these arenas um, along known routes. So 26% 26 of their time they were locomoting. The really fascinating one is 22% of their time they spent grooming. That's a quarter almost of their day and well over a quarter of their waking day was spent grooming themselves, keeping themselves clean. And that kind of makes sense because if you're a rat living in a sewer, if you're a mouse living, you know, in a chicken farm, you are constantly surrounded by muck and grime. And for an animal that has no ready access to healthcare, even the smallest cut, snick, you know, bite mark, break in the skin can rapidly turn septic and can kill you. You know, you can be the biggest, meanest, angriest dog rat going and you will still suffer sepsis at the result of an infected wound. So grooming is actually a huge part of their lives and a huge part of what they do. Resting, they spent about 90% of their day. Eating, about 18% of their day. But this is where it starts to get interesting because when you start to have a look at foraging and exploring, it's about 4 and 3% respectively. And as pest management operators, I would say that most of what we do, most of what we focus on is putting down a uh, rodenticidal bait and trying to get them to eat it. Now, of course, they spend 18% of their days eating. Hey, happy days. But at the same time, that's eating what they know. That's eating from food sources that they consider and deem already to be safe. In fact, foraging only accounts for about 4% of their day. So the likelihood that they go off looking for a new bait source is actually only about 4% of the day. And that is actually what you're tapping into. You're hoping to get into that 18%, to get play into that 80% of the day where they're eating constantly. But realistically, to begin with, you're having to deal with only 4% of their day looking for an alternative, looking for new sources of food. 
Now, you can use this in other ways. Number one, which is if you know, you know, locomotion, 26 percent of their day is spent walking in known routes, trusted routes, especially rats who form habitual pathways of movement. If you know that they're spending a quarter of their day walking along those lines, then that's where you know, you're going to have the highest likelihood of encountering and engaging those rodents. The other fantastic one to have a look at is grooming. And we have a range of products out there specifically designed to take this into effect. So you can marry those two up if you know where they're walking and you know you can put a placement in line with that and you know they're going to have to groom whatever they get on their coat back off again. You're then playing into that 48% of their day. So have a look at this graph. Take a picture of it if you like, just to have a think about what rats are actually doing with their day because we're all very guilty that we'll turn up site and you know when was the last time ask yourself when was the last time you had the opportunity to actually sit and watch a rat doing what it does naturally and i have to say more often than not it's probably not going to be very often is it so keep this in mind as we talk and then we're going to just discuss a little bit more about how it is that rodents um perceive the world and then that will help us understand a bit more about that graph now what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about, you know, I, we always talk about how bad rodent eyesight is. Um, and what we're going to do now is we're actually going to talk about, you know, we, we talk about how bad rodent eyesight is and we talk about how good our eyesight is comparatively. Um, but I wanted to sort of like just put it out there. Our eyesight is actually fairly awful. We assume that it's very good because we we see in three, you know, we see in the full spectrum. Are you having a look at this picture here? And you can see all of the colors from violet all the way down to red. But realistically speaking, your brain is making up a lot of this. And, and I can prove this. Your brain makes up a huge amount of the information that you get from your eyes. Um, and the next slide will actually prove how alarming this is. But number one, we have here, of course, this, um, this chart. And we are what we call trichromats. We can see in, we have three colors that we can see. We have three um, cones at the back of our eye that pick up, pick up three different wavelengths of light. So we can perceive blue, we can perceive green, and we can perceive red. Now you might realize in that, when you actually have a look at this chart, we don't have a cone that can see yellow specifically. No, what our, cone, what our brain does is it says, right, if we are seeing something, and we are getting our red and our blue photoreceptors firing simultaneously, but not as high as we would expect them to do from having pure blue or pure red, then it's got to be something in between. And that something in between is going to sit about here, it's going to sit about yellow, and we're going to call it yellow. So in reality, our brains have made up the colour yellow. We can definitely see blue, we can definitely see green, we can definitely see red, but yellow, we have no physical mechanism to see the yellow wavelength. It is inferred from all of the other information we've got. So although we can see yellow, we can't actually perceive it. So your brain makes up all that information, which is phenomenal. Now, flip side of that, rats are dichromats. They can only see in blues and greens. So anything beyond green to them, the yellows, the oranges and reds, they can't even infer because they can't bracket it. To them, it's grey and it will always be grey. They have no way of understanding what those colours may be. So this is, the, this is the test to prove that actually your eyes are not what they are um, telling you. So what I'd like you to do very quickly is if the little dot is on the left hand side of your screen, I'd like you to cover up your left eye and with your right eye, look at the little dot. And at some point, if you are sat at uh, the right distance, this is all very subjective to see in the right distance. But if you're sat about a foot and a half away from your screen, if you cover up your right eye, your left eye, and you look at the dot with your right eye, at some point, that big dot will disappear. Now, hopefully, at least it's done for some of you. You can shout out in the chat if it's working. But what this is, is actually in the back of your eye, where all of those rods and cones, which are picking up all that visual information, they've got to have a nerve fibre that connects all the way to the back of your brain. And that nerve fibre has to get out the back of your eye somewhere. And where it gets out the back of your eye, of course, naturally, you can't have any rods and cones. So there is a big spot at the back of your eye where there is no sensory information coming in whatsoever. And it actually sits right, right out in the middle of your field of view. So what's happening is you have a big zone in your field of view where there is no sight whatsoever. And your brain just basically backfills it from all the information around and about and on the outside of that. And you never realize it's happening. So of course, this all goes back to me saying we think our sight, to, our, our, our vision is pretty good, but actually it's our brains that are phenomenal. It's our brains that are backfilling in all that information. Our eyesight's actually pretty, pretty rubbish. So if our eyesight's pretty rubbish, 
how rubbish is their eyesight with that? Well, with this, you know, rodents are assumed to have a very poor visual acuity. It's about 20 over 600. So with most people, most human beings, um, we have 20-20 vision, which means we can see letters that are 20 inches high at 20 feet away. With rodents, those letters are 20, um, you know, at, at 20 feet away, those letters would need to be 600 inches high, 56 feet high. As I said before, they're dichromats, so they're actually colorblind to anything red, yellow and orange. Um, but they can see into ultraviolet, which kind of makes sense when we're going to talk about urine in just a second. And finally, position of the eyes is very in, uh, indicative of a prey animal. So their eyesight is not necessarily for navigation or for identification. It's for looking up their two little turrets to let them know if there's something swooping over them about to pick them up and turn them into buzzard poop. So that is what their eyes are actually doing. So this would be what we see with all that full range of colours and that, you know, 2020 vision. If you start to take those other colours out, this is actually what you start to see. And then when you start to take away that acuity, you know, to a rodent, it's not going to be able to sit there and be like, ah, that's the longer horned, you know, eagle owl or, or whatever, whatever species that may be. It simply just knows there is a dangerous thing moving towards it and to skedaddle. This is, this is the flip side of it. And this is, you know, from the other way, you could see your brain could rationalize what it was as we lost that information. But if you take that the other side, there we go. What's this? We've had all those colors taken away. We've had all of that uh, visual acuity taken away. What is it? Well, obviously it, it's, a, it's a lily pad, but of course, you know, so rodents are not using their eyes to make these decisions. So we need to understand what they are using in order to make all of these decisions. Um, and as I said, poor eyesight means that they're at immediate disadvantage. This is why these animals are crispuscular, because they will operate when the daytime predators have gone away and the nighttime predators are still to wake up. Um, and they rely on these other senses to try and make up for this very poor eyesight. Now, what they do in order to make up for their poor eyesight is they have a phenomenal sense of smell, and they actually have two senses of smell. One, very much like our own, which we'll talk about now, which is this coiled epithelium inside their nose. And before the times of serious ethic review boards, scientists used to do a lot of weird things. And once uh, one experiment they did is they put a load of probes into the brain of a rat. And with rats, um, all of these chemoreceptors in their nose are hardwired to structures that we call barrels within the brain. So each one of these little squares is actually indicative of one of these barrels in the brain. And so when we smell things, it's a, it's a memory event. It smells like toast. It smells like strawberries. It smells like caramel. For these guys, when a smell is wafted underneath their nose, it fires those very specific barrels within its brain. So this is the activation map that you would expect to see in a rat's brain every time that it smelt vanilla. And of course, you could put something else underneath there, strawberries, uh, licorice, anything you like. And then as soon as you put vanilla underneath, boom, it's exactly that same map again. So these animals are acutely aware, more so than we are, as to what they are smelling. So phenomenal sense of smell, much more than ours straight away. And if you have a look at this video very, very quickly, Pick any rat, pick any rat you like and watch it wandering about. Um, oh, or, or maybe not. Hang on, let's try, and, let's try that again, shall we? Pick any rat you like and notice that as it's moving around, run, stop, sniff, run, stop, sniff, sniff. These animals are not navigating using their eyes. They are navigating using their noses. I'll do that again, pick another rat run stop sniff it's all to do with their noses they are finding their ways around they are taking the cues from their environment with their noses so with that we've got to talk about the other sense of smell that rodents have um and with that we're going to talk about this thing called the von nasal organ and we historically evolutionary used to have one, but we don't, it's defunct anymore. Um, what rodents have is this organ, which is able on contact, so they can't draw it through the air like we would do our normal sense of smell. Now this has to be by contact, they have to press their nose against something. Um, and they're able to wick up um, these proteins uh, which are found within urine, are found within feces, and found within saliva and mother's milk, they can wick them up, and these proteins are stuffed with pheromones, and they're covered in receptors as well. So the combination of all three of those factors actually means that rodents are able to communicate a huge amount of information from their urine, from their feces, from their saliva, and from mother's milk. Information such as sex, reproductive status, if they're familiar or unfamiliar, who they are, you know, social status, if they're stressed out. So when we talk about, you know, finding urine pillars from mice, 
This is what this is. This is all of those proteins stacked one on top of the other. That urine pillar is not a urine pillar. That urine pillar is Facebook. Uh, that urine pillar is, is Twitter. And if you have a look at this right here, we have a latrine rather handily on top of a latrine. But I've just mentioned how phenomenal that sense of smell is. And yet you're about to watch this rat stick its schnoz right on top of that big pile of crap. And what it's doing there is it's it's checking, you know, checking Messenger, checking Facebook. This is Twitter or, or shitter, depending on which way you want to have a look at it. That is that rat catching up with all of its mates information. Are they stressed? Are they happy? Is someone looking for a little bit of nookie? What's going on here? So that's how they communicate. That is by far and away. So their sense of smell drives a lot of their behavior from their interactions with one another to their finding their way around the environment. So as I said before, so much sensory input is based on the sense of smell. It, it dominates their behavior. Um, also, Populations who are under pressure, serious pressure from predators or disease or from us, you know, counting as technically both, means that they can communicate this in their urine, it can cause a bit of a fracturing effect, but also they can cause, they can form food preferences and aversions taken from the milk of their parents. So this will build on quite nicely into taste. Now, we always say you never find a fat rat, but this is one that we had, uh, I had growing up, and it had a mutant gene in it, which meant that it just put on weight, and it put on weight. And look at the size of that thing. I think when we, when it finally um, passed away, of natural causes, I may add, um, it was 750 grams. It was absolutely whopping. Um, but with their sense of taste, they will do multiple things. They will form food preferences. They can form food aversions. Uh, and the, the two that are actually quite interesting to us as pest managers, because as I say, we're trying to feed into this foraging behavior, this 4% of their day where they're looking for new food. They will do this to fill, fulfill specific dietary needs. They'll look for new sources of food to make sure that they are getting everything that they can get from their food all of those micronutrients as opposed to as well as those macronutrients and the interesting thing as well is they will stop eating they you know un un unlike this uh lovely lady here who definitely did not have that particular feedback mechanism in place um most normal rats will stop eating because if you think about it if you are you know one rat in many and your harbourage is suddenly flicked over and a predator swoops down and tries to eat you um it does not behoove you to be the largest, slowest rat going. You need to be fit and healthy and young. So what they need to do is they need to make sure that they manage their diet adequately so they will stop eating. They will eat to an energy budget, which can make them very predictable, uh, but also very difficult to work with. Um, and as I say, you know, they're omnivorous. Cereals make up most of their diets, but they are showing huge levels of habitualization, which means they will eat from sources of food to be safe. In addition, we have neophobia, which is, you know, they won't eat from sources of food that they don't know. So they will transfer these feeding preferences between each other in, and also between generations. So when we have a look at uh, a couple of lab studies that were done, there was this fantastic study where they took a mother rat who had a whole load of pups and they gave mum two choices, a, um, a palatable food and the same palatable food that had been let to go uh, a little bit moldy, a little bit spoiled. And of course she had the choice and she will try a little from column A, a little from column B and definitely decided that from column A was preferable. And so ate that in preference to the other food. Now, as she was weaning her pups, she passed that preference on because she will pass that information on through these protein markers and pheromones in her saliva and in her milk. Now, when they took those same mice, sorry, those same pups, those same rat pups, and as soon as they had weaned, before they'd taken any solid food, and as soon as they'd stopped weaning from mum, they took them away, put them into another cage and gave them three foods the good food, the spoiled food, and a completely different food. Now with that, each and every single pup, every time they did this experiment, without fail, took their first feed from the good food that mum had been eating, because that's what mum had told them was safe. So these feeding preferences can actually pass through generations. Again, fascinating for rodents, an absolute pain in the behind when we are trying to encourage rodents to eat something new and novel, because they have these mechanisms built in, which is you do what you know is safe, and that's what doesn't kill you. So that's what we're trying to break. That's what we're trying to get around. Um, and of course, they eat in different ways as well. Rats will eat chunking down at the top like a banana. Mice, on the other hand, will hold it more like it's a corn on the cob, and they'll strip it off the outside because they are trying to get to the soft nougaty bit in the middle. Unfortunately, though, where's all the poison held? 
impacts on the outside, isn't it? So the behavior of eating can have significant impacts on the rodents because mice are less likely to consume higher doses of poison from a whole wheat bait because they will frass the outside of it off and simply spit it onto the floor. So you've got to think about that as well, species adaptations. Um, now, we're going to talk about, we've talked about fooding preferences. Now we're going to talk about feeding aversion. So a study was done by this gentleman called Garcia in 1955. And Garcia was a scientist, but more specifically, he was also a psychopath. Because what he did is he took rodents and he would give them a little dose. You take rodents in a pen, you take one of them away and you give them a dose of saccharin on a pipette, nice sweet substance. And then you take that rat who had just been given this nice sweet substance and you put it in a microwave. Now, of course, he wasn't trying to make a sweet, meaty treat. What he was actually trying to do was hurt this animal in a way that it could not comprehend or conceive. So it associated the pain it suddenly um, experienced, which was non-lethal, um, to what it had just eaten, as opposed to any other factor. So, of course, this rat who had just had saccharin, suddenly blinding pain, and now it associates that pain with the saccharin. Interesting thing is that he put that rat back in the cage. It was sat there, not very good. You know, you don't know where I've been, man, and all that stuff. Um, and it actually passed that food aversion onto the other, pe uh, other people, <laughs> the other rodents within that environment. A and what happened there was actually um, when they took um, those rats away, of course, when they took that same rat away and they gave it saccharin, it flipped out because it was expecting the pain to occur. When they gave other rats in that environment saccharin as well, they too flipped out because they knew something bad was about to happen. They didn't know what, but they knew something bad. So they, they were able to pass feeding aversions on to each other through these um, proteins and pheromones on their saliva. You know, I feel terrible. My proteins are reflecting that. And this is the last thing I ate. So amazing amount of communication, again, done through this sense of smell. Um, and there we go. Rodents showed a future aversion to saccharin as well. Uh, Un uh, understandably, I, I would say with that. So let's talk about their whiskers. And I'm very cognizant of the time. So let's let's keep going. Um, whiskers. So with us, our whiskers are, well, they're, they're, they're a cosmetic appendage. Mine are to hide the fact that I have my father's double chin. Um, and some uh, are, are, you know, for Movember and others are just simply a fashion statement. But with rodents, their whiskers are a functional tool and they are very, very, um, what's the right word? They're incredible um, because each of those long, thick whiskers and the smaller micro visi, the small whiskers you see around the muzzle as well, each of those ends in a capsule of blood um, and muscles around it. So every time that whisker moves or is moved, it is relating sensory information back to that animal. And not only do they have this uh, sense of touch within the whiskers on their face, but of course, if you ever had a look at a, a brown rat up close and noticed that, you know, every 50th hair is slightly longer than the rest, those two are also picking up that same sensory information. Uh, and this whole system of feedback through touch is known as the Vibrissi system. And you can see here on these muscles, it's not just a random arrangement of thick whiskers on their face. It's very specific. They are aligned in a very specific way. They're making this, to want of a better word, a, a sonar net around their head. And if you have a look at it a little bit more close up, you can see what I mean about each one of these little thick, fur, uh, thick hairs ends in this capsule of blood and liquid, which means that every time that hair moves, it causes that sinal capsule to deform in a very predictable way. So they know exactly what they're doing. In fact, they they reckon that the sense of touch that they get from our, their whiskers it is the same, if not probably better than the sense of touch we get from our fingertips. So next time you have your cameras up and you're watching rodents interact with your latest placement or even a snap trap, you'll see that the first time they ever interact with it, they will lean right forwards. They'll keep their body back and they'll keep their head forwards. And if you look very closely, they will actually, using the muscles in these sinal capsules, they'll waft all of their um, vibrissi forwards to touch what it is that they are about to encounter. And of course, if they've encountered something like it before and it's made a large banging noise, um, they're less likely to then encounter it. So they will avoid that placement or they'll avoid that in the future. So there's a tremendous amount of feedback with this. But also, as I said, it also feeds back to this thegmataxic response. Those large guard hairs on the sides of their bodies are able to, to give sensory information as they run alongside objects. As you can see here, that running alongside objects, as we all know, 
is what results in this greasy um, deposit. So it's all part of that same feedback system from their whiskers to their coat. Um, and the very interesting thing that occurred with that is they took it, they did another experiment. They actually snipped the whiskers off a uh, dominant male. So they took the dominant male in a hierarchy and they snipped its whiskers off. And because it suddenly lost that feedback information, because it lost that ability to sense objects that were immediately in front of its face, it went from being the most dominant animal to the most timid animal in that pile. And so, the, you know, the, the actual confidence they have in their whiskers is so phenomenal that that is, uh, it, it affects their social dominance and their behavior as a result. Um, and you can see here, when we talk about thecomataxis and this wanting to be close to one another, this again is Church Farm. And if anyone remembers Church Farm, it was a phenomenal place. But the difference between the top picture and the bottom left picture um, is we didn't take, every time we had to clean that pen out, we didn't take the rodents away. We didn't have somewhere else to put them. We simply had to sweep up and around them. But of course, that act of sweeping and clattering and banging things got all of these rodents, you know, very nervous. And so they all went for cover. In that top picture, there's probably about 150 to 200 rats. In that bottom left picture, there is 150 to 200 rats under three stacks of pallets. Uh, and I got one of my lab techs, um, bless her, to stick her hand in that. Well, I didn't get her to stick a hand in it because that would be a wild breach of health and safety to take a picture from the edge of it with a camera. And you can see there, there they are, Thigma taxes all bunched up together trying to keep safe. Um, but I'd just like you to remember, if I can lose 150 rats underneath three pallet stacks in your warehouse or 200 pallets, how easy is it going to be to lose 30 rats without too much of a fuss? Pretty easy, right? So there we go. So that's the sense of touch done. Um, and as before, this stigma text behavior, you can see there studies that have been done showing that they have a significant preference to stigma taxes when put into these um, water mazes and these uh, active mazes. They will stick to the edges where, where they can more often than not. Uh, and again, it's all down to the fact that because they have poor eyesight, they're operating at times of day more conducive to them, mostly in, uh, in the dark. So, of course, you've got to rely heavily on your nose. You've got to rely heavily on your sense of touch in order to find your ways around. Um, and this stigmatexis response also plays into this um, sense of what we call kinesis. So they did a study with this where they would take a rat and they gave it two two options they gave it you know a food at one end and the entry to the other end and the idea was is over a certain amount of time in the pitch black they are observed using infrared cameras in the pitch black they were allowed to move from a to b on their own volition and they, they found their own route and the route was not the most circuitous route but it was the route that they felt safest with and so they'd walk along the tables they'd walk along the chairs and the desks in this environment now what the uh, researchers then did is then they took away certain tables and chairs from the middle and they found to their astonishment that this kinesis and the stigma taxes still played in because the rodents would still walk around those objects even though they weren't there anymore because this muscle memory had built up and it was so ingrained then in their behavior that they would still operate and they'd still walk as if those things were still there finally we've got to talk about reproduction and survival and you can see here, these guys have multiple generations in one uh, sitting. So they'll have, um, when they have weaned litter one, they'll be giving birth to litter two, and they'll be pregnant with litter three. And you can see that immediately here. It makes them such wonderful conveyor belts of jelly beans. Uh, but just to put this into some context, we say breeds like rabbits. We should really probably say breeds like mice, because if we were to take one male rat mouse and one male uh, female, if you <laughs> one male mouse and one female mouse, uh, and you allow them to breed and then breed with their offspring and their offspring to breed with each other, and you allow this to go on for a year, you can see that the numbers get pretty huge. And in fact, if you stack them head to tail, assuming that they're about 10 centimeters, then generation one would be about as long as your average bread bin. Generation two would span all the way across the table. Generation nine would get from where I'm sitting right now to the Isle of Wight. 10 would get from where I'm sitting to Paris. And then generation 12 would get all the way from where we're all sitting now, all the way over to Brazil. So you can see that actually, the number of animals um, in this is, is is huge, and we've got to we've got to think about you know why it is that we are not all knee deep in mice, and it is because they are food to a lot of animals, and because we do what we do. Uh, and here we go; we can see some of the 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 survival mechanisms and the survival barrels that are uh, 
evident of this is what keeps them safe when they are not uh, out and about scurrying, looking for those new sources of food or grooming. Um, but what I have to say is we are all very guilty for assuming that these holes in the floor are just holes in the floor which end in a cavity and that is that. Now actually these holes in the floor form a really complicated and intricate network of tunnels and chambers underneath the ground. As you can see here, these would be the entrance holes, you know, 11, 12, 13 would be the entrance holes to that burrow system. But within that, it just does not end in a cavity. They connect to one another. There is an intricate system of nests, caches, cavities within that. So it's actually a very complicated system under the ground. Again, this is what makes things like sewers so attractive to rodents, because it is a mock-up of exactly what they're doing in the wild. So you can see here just some examples, you know, if you've got that great big stack of um, old bags by the side of your grain, then that's what you're going to find underneath it. The farmer's old bait box, which has just been repurposed as a nice uh, burrow. And again, they will tend to fill their nests. And this will be the last thing I say before we um, pop off and I hand over. But the nests they make are always highly insulative. And my last word, and this is what I'd say would be the, the driving factor between, behind a lot of mouse behavior specifically, is if you take heat loss uh, as a driver for behavior, especially in survival, if you have a large spherical object like an elephant, it has a very large volume and a very small surface area. As, as you have a large spherical object, it struggles to hold on to heat. If you have a small sausage-like object like a mouse, it... Um, so it struggles to hold. Uh, it struggles to hold on to its heat, and so its entire behaviour is driven by holding on to heat. Um, and that was it. So you know, it it, it eats more. Uh, it makes sure that it can get um, you know warm surroundings. It stops breeding over winter because it needs the energy, and it will frass its grain in order to make sure it gets the most energy from it. Oh, there we go. Sorry, a couple of minutes over. But uh, I'll just put up the last slide just again, if you don't mind. Um, which is my contact details. If anyone wants to ask any more questions or has any more um, queries, either take a screenshot of this or if you scan the QR code, it should give you my contact details. So there we go. Tremendously sorry, John, for running over a little bit, but but there we go. That is not a problem. Uh, spot <laughs> on. Um, we've got a couple of questions uh, which we will uh, just go through. Um, so, is there any studies on how long pheromones in rat urine remains available for other rats to sniff and get information from? So, actually, there was a really interesting project called Scentmark, which was run by the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, where they tried to, um, for want of a better word, weaponize the um, proteins and pheromones within the urine in order to try and make them useful for a pest control thing. So, for animals such as timber wolves, foxes, um, other animals such as that, their pheromones dissipate, they're highly volatile, so they dissipate very, very quickly. So when they don't um, perpetually reinforce those, they disappear very quickly. But because with um, rats and mice, because these pheromones are wedged into these barrel shaped proteins, it's less like a link spray and more like a Yankee candle. So they actually persist for a long time. Uh, and if, even when the pheromones have dissipated, the proteins and their receptors will remain. So with that, actually, we have um, th that information can last days, weeks, you know, depending on the environment, maybe even longer. So yes, it lasts for a long, old time. I suppose it, like with when you look at um, urine pillars, I suppose they're topping up that information regularly as well. It, it kind of stays um, for a longer period. Yes, absolutely. So, so the more they reinforce it, the longer that information is going to be there, be current and be 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 useful. So absolutely. Yeah. What's the um, just off the back of that? What's the reason behind I've found it many a time where you have um, like a bait tray and they'll urinate in the tray. Is there a, a reason for that or is that just they've decided to use it as a toilet after they've ate from it so we 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 say things like uh, rats and mice are incontinent because they're constantly urinating everywhere they go. Uh, but the reality of it is, is they are being very specific about where they urinate. They're, they're urinating everywhere because they are talking to one another as they do this. So you're probably finding they're urinating on and around the bait, um, bait tray in the bait box because it's a place they deem to be safe. And they're telling other rodents, you know, been here, food's here, um, it's safe. Or alternatively, if they're the dominant animal, this is mine. You know, I am the dominant animal. I was here. This is mine. Everyone else, you know, ask my permission or just simply fox for Oscar. So, so lots of, lots of information that is in that urine. It could be one of a multiple of things there. Good. Um, if uh, this one's from Colin, if 22% of rodents time is spent grooming, why can't we use rodenticides such as contact gels for rats? 
um, the label is uh, only for um, house mice at the minute. Uh, and Raccoon Foam is available for uh, rats and mice with it being a, a first gen. Um, why can't we use that second gen for so for this this will go all the way back to ryan's talk earlier which is when the manufacturers um put in for these label claims they have to like follow it up with the data and reasonable studies as to why they want to put that species on there so you probably find that when um contact gel came out it would the studies were all done on mice assuming that mice would have been um the target species and there would have been no data either presented or undertaken on rats and so if they were unable to um present that data to hsc then they wouldn't have been able to make that specific label claim that being said you know if there's enough call for it Ask the manufacturers, you know, ask them to do the data, but it, it, it's all a cost risk reward um, matrix at that point. So I can't tell you any further than that. I'm really sorry. Yeah, good. Um, will cleaning, cleaning rodent monitor boxes um, outside keep rodents away? Um, technically not. A brand new box will... Um, have an adverse effect on rodent interaction simply because it does not smell like the environment. It doesn't smell like the environment it's situated in. And as that box weathers more and becomes more synonymous with the environment it's sat in, the actual, um, you know, the, the, the distrust of it will, will lessen. Um, so cleaning them in the sense that brushing them free, taking all of that detritus out, um, no, it, it won't detract them from it. Dunking them in a bucket of bleach and taking all of those smells away and replacing them with, you know, the clinical smell of bleach may have an adverse effect. Uh, it very much depends on that population of rodents. I, I can't say what will put them off. Sorry, I can't say what will attract them, but I can definitely say that, you know, smells that are more like the environment will certainly be more acceptable to rodents um, entering that that area. Yeah, I was, I was always mindful when I was a technician that if I anything I put on the box, you know, if you're trying to clean it with a spray or anything like that, um, could be a, a deterrent rather than, um, you know, making the box look pretty as it were um so yeah always mindful of that one um and you mentioned about um traps and how they react and they'll feel the trap first um with trap avoidance do you think it's uh more um the feel of the trap because they associate it with danger or the trap attractant that they've associated with danger over time it, it could be a host of things. And actually, the RRAG group at the moment is looking very heavily into what we call behavioral resistance. And behavioral resistance will feed into these, um, you know, any kind of uh, alter in uh, alteration in behavior, which has a negative impact on um, control processes. And so the avoidance of bait, the avoidance of bait boxes or the avoidance of traps for one mechanism or another all falls into that and yes it can be a host of reasons from they've encountered something like this before or they've encountered an animal who was trapped in a trap or they've encountered an animal who's dead in a trap and they've made that associative link between either the smell the feel or you know some other physical attribute that they are aware of of that situation and then that object and they've put the a and b together and that's told them it's no longer a safe thing so of course yes it, it probably is either the the feel of them the height of them the texture of them um it's why traps in certain places and certain locations will have a much higher uh success rate hit rate because it takes away those natural advantages uh, as opposed to other traps which may well you know be be more visible let's say to the rodent sensors Super. That is all the questions today, Alex. Thank you very much. It is fascinating as always. Um, and we will see you soon. Thank you very much. Bye, guys.